member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, uh, the official student group of, of the institution. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members have access to the exciting opportunities through their involvement with the Institute. This includes volunteering for the evening programs and networking with our social guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and thank you for attending today's program. Today's program is live streamed and the video is available on our YouTube channel. You can also access videos of past programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. After the program, we will have some time for, audience, for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask one brief question. Virtual viewers may ask their questions, may send their questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. The, Institute's the Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often, dif and often difficult topics. Uh, please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones, and now please join me in welcoming our Director of Programs and Student Affairs, Sarah Stacy. Thank you, Anna. So good afternoon, and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. Today, Dr. Erica Cornelius Smith will discuss her book, Service Above Self, Women, Veterans, and American Politics. After her presentation, there will be a book sale and signing. So before I introduce her, I have a couple announcements. Please join us tomorrow, Wednesday, November 16th at 4 p.m. for our final discussion group. Fall fellow Jerry Side will analyze the impact of the elections with journalists John Harwood and Lindsay Wise. So with so many intriguing results, you won't want to miss it. Um, additionally, please note that Director Bill Lacey will return for, to moderate an expert panel um, for the Kansas Post-Election Conference. That will be December 6th at 2 p.m. And then a National Post-Election Conference on December 7th at 3 p.m. and December 8th at 9.30 a.m. Okay, and now please join me in welcoming Dr. Erica Cornelius Smith, Director of Alumni Relations at Marietta College. Her book, Service Above Self, is the first analyst of how women transitioned from national defense to public service and what they did when they got to DC. Previously, she was Associate Professor of International Relations, or sorry, International Business and Political Science. She holds a BA in Philosophy and Political Science, an MA in Political Science, and a PhD in history. So now join me in welcoming her. Magical. There we go. It works. <laughs> it's not on the TV. Let me see, what if we do this? Thank you, Sam. So before I begin, I'd like to take a moment first to thank the Dole Institute for inviting me out to speak to you all today. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be here to address audiences in the same room as some of the more national and international figures that you've had. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation and hospitality and insider tours that I have received today. <laughs> Um, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Erica Cornelia Smith and I work in the Office of Advancement at Marietta College. Now when I started working on this project, I was an Associate Professor of Political Science and U.S. History, teaching international business courses at a private college in New England. About 85% of my students there majored in business, so I developed a civic leadership program to try to help provide them with knowledge and tools to understand how governments and public policy and public management work. As a scholar, um, outside of all my teaching responsibilities, I've written on a wide variety of topics, um, but I think probably my passion and my principal interest is in the area of women in political leadership, whether they are elected, appointed, first ladies, their depictions in popular culture, um, this is really sort of my passion and research, and that brings me to the topic of our conversation today. 
In the fall of 2018, I was scheduled to teach two sections of Introduction to Political Science, and I really wanted my students to engage with the 2018 midterms at the time. So I decided to create a project I called Better Know an Election, inspired in part by Better Know a District, a recurring segment on the Colbert Report. If you're unfamiliar, Better Know a District offers a humorous examination of different U.S. congressional districts in each segment, and that generally includes an interview with the representative from the district. For our political science class, I asked students to examine different congressional elections across the U.S., not in their home district or state. And then they had to share that analysis with the class. We ended up profiling 65 different elections that semester. The students and I learned that 2018 was an incredible year for women in politics. Women were elected in the 2018 midterms at historic rates. The record-breaking number of women candidates drew comparisons to the last time there was a so-called year of the woman, 1992. And in both years, the country was grappling with investigations of sexual misconduct by high-profile men. A significant number of predominantly male lawmakers were retiring and voters expressed some preference for political outsiders, regardless of their gender. When the ballots were counted in November 2018, America elected four women to the U.S. Senate and 24 women as representatives to Congress. Now, among this historical number of women running for office that year were an equally unprecedented number of female military veterans and former intelligence officers, though this was noted less frequently in the stories and headlines about the midterm results. Nearly 200 veterans representing active duty, reserves, and Coast Guard service entered congressional races. About one third of those running were veterans with political experience or incumbent candidates, and more than half of the candidates were nominated by just the Republican Party. Of the veterans running for the House, 12 were women, marking the highest number ever. When the election results were counted in November, 16 former service members, including three women, won their races. This was the most, quote, new veterans since 2010. The number of veterans seeking political office increased slightly again in 2020, and among them were 24 women, doubling the number seeking election in 2018 midterms. And if you're interested, and if we have time a little later towards the end of the talk, I sort of looked at the results from 22, and we can kind of take a look at where things stand there today. So remind me if, if we want to go that direction. While this electoral trend continued in the 2020 election, I was wrapping up a short piece on Tulsi Gabbard's presidential bid. But as I studied the 2018 returns and the developing candidacies and the 2020 election cycle, I noted that Gabbard was one of several women with a record of active military service or veteran status in Congress. Inspired by their diverse paths to politics and the ways in which they communicated their own stories, as well as their policy positions, I wanted to write a book that illustrates the significance of this new cohort of political women. The questions I wanted to ask, what motivates them to run for office? How do they connect their military service to their careers in public service? Does having a military or intelligence background allow them to overcome gendered stereotypes about women candidates, particularly in the area of foreign policy? And as I was gathering materials to analyze the communication strategies of these women, I was unable to find secondary literature or scholarly investigations of their lives that could serve as the basis for further analysis. So I started writing my own biographical sketches based on the research that I compiled from a variety of primary sources, and I thought this would lay the foundation for my communication strategy analysis. But in the end, each sketch developed into a fuller story that included the personal background of the candidate, their military or intelligence service achievements, their campaigns, their work as legislators. And in the end, I thought the significance and the complexity of each woman's path from military service to public service was a compelling story on its own. So at the time I started writing, there were no scholarly treatments or historic sort of contributions on these women. And this is where I began this journey. Now, <clears throat> though more women with military and intelligence backgrounds are seeking national political office, the larger trend in Congress has been a decline in the number of representatives with service experience. According to Pew Research Center, less than 20% of the Senate and House were veterans in 2016, 
compared to about 7% of the overall US population. In the early 2000s, scholars identified what they called a generation-long decline of military experience among those seeking national political office. And as legislators who were veterans of World War II and the Korean War retire and leave office, they're often replaced by candidates who have no political or no military service, who maybe came of age during the Vietnam War or after and then have a lower probability of service engagement. This generational turnover has perpetuated concerns that politicians without service experience or a military background might behave differently than those with service experience and backgrounds, particularly on issues of foreign policy and defense. So the charts I'm sharing up here indicate the numbers serving in the House and the Senate, and it's depicted in line graph form on the side. So it really sort of reveals the trend in case the little tiny numbers are hard to see. With these concerns in mind, both major political parties engaged in vigorous recruitments of recruitment efforts, um, specifically focusing on Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans in 2006 and 2008 congressional cycles. And those efforts continued through the next decade to the 2018 midterms, when groups such as the Service First Women's Victory Fund worked to recruit and support Democratic women candidates with military service backgrounds. Oh, is it scratching it? Yeah, probably. Thanks, Sarah. So, Service Above Self synthesizes the stories of the first women with military, quasi-military, or intelligent backgrounds entering political office. Identifying a form of service as military or quasi-military is both a gendered and political process. The term quasi-military was actually utilized by uh, scholar Susan Zeiger, who writes about women in World War I and the American Expeditionary Forces. Legislation formally allowing women into the military was passed in 1948, though tens of thousands had served in both world wars. Prior to even the 20th century, women like Harriet Tubman and Mary Walker served in the Civil Wars as nurses, spies, and soldiers, disguising themselves as men. And during World War I, women were mobilized on a large scale by the armed services, with tens of thousands serving in civilian roles under the auspices of the American Expeditionary Forces, or the AEF, in the Army, enlisting as civilian workers in the Navy, the Marine Corps, working as ambulance drivers, bacteriologists, dietitians, and librarians. This service in war, provided primarily by women, has been more than a simple extension of their participation in the civilian labor force. It's also military or quasi-military service. In seeking acknowledgement of their contributions, women of the AEF adopted a new name for themselves, service women, and this is the term that I use in my writing. It was codifying this identity in 1921 through the organization of the Women's Overseas Service League, which was the first veterans organization of women in the United States. At that time, service women returned to the U.S. from overseas and most lacked assistance or benefits extended to male service members because of their lack of formal status. With few exceptions, service women were classified as civilians and not entitled to benefits. So no housing, no food, no insurance, no medical care, no legal protection, no pensions, no compensation for their families in the case of death. These inequities became more apparent when women in the AEF learned that their British counterparts serving in France did have access to many of those same benefits at that time. So the WOSL was formed not only to maintain social connections among the women who served and formed lasting relationships, but also to institutionalize the memory of women's service and provide aid, both financial and otherwise, to returning service women. But equally important for the service, women, service members the struggle over veterans' benefits was about more than just money. It was intimately connected to the larger post-war struggles over women's rights and citizenship and women's civic status. Scholars have also documented the significance of women's services during World War II, both on the home front and abroad, as a turning point for women in U.S. history. And with respect to the military, women volunteers came to be viewed, quote, not just as a source of women's skills, as a valuable source of high quality personnel to meet overall manpower requirements for the massive military buildup. And by December of 1941, 350,000 women served with the US Armed Forces. 
as a result of policies and programs created by early cohorts of congressional women, women serving in office, those serving during World War II had their own branches of service. So this included the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, later the Women's Army Corps, or WAC, WAC, the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, WASP, and the Women Accepted for Volunteer Military Service, WAVES. Women served in the Marines and in a branch of the U.S. Coast Guard, the U.S. Women's Reserve, also known by the Coast Guard motto, Semper Paratus, Always Ready, or the SPARS. Women were not permitted to participate directly in armed conflict, but their responsibilities often brought them close to the front lines, and their work in the Army and Navy Medical Corps could be extremely dangerous. For those women not serving directly alongside the armed forces, many participated in service with organizations such as the American Red Cross, the United Service Organizations, and the Civil Air Patrol. By the 1970s, women were permitted to enter military service academies, and nearly two decades later, following the rescinding of the risk rule in 1988, service women gained government approval to fly combat missions or serve on Navy combat ships, though they were arguably exposed to combat prior to formal recognition of this service. In 2020, there were seven women with military or intelligence backgrounds in the US Congress, representing the largest cohort of women with military and intelligence backgrounds serving in elected national office. Representative Tulsi Gabbard, Democrat from Hawaii, Army National Guard. Representative Chrissy Houlihan, Democrat from Pennsylvania, Air Force. Representative Elaine Luria, Democrat from Virginia, Navy. Representative Mikey Sherrill, Democrat from New Jersey, Air Force. Senator Joni Ernst, Republican from Iowa, Army Reserve and National Guard. Senator Tammy Duckworth, Democrat from Illinois, Army Reserve and National Guard. And Senator Martha McSally, Representative or Republican from Arizona from the Air Force. Their growing numbers led to the creation of the Service Women and Women's Veteran Congressional Caucus. There were finally enough of them to caucus. Um, chaired by Representative Chrissy Houlihan and co-founded by Tulsi Gabbard, Elaine Luria, and Mikey Sherrill. So, the significance and complexity of each individual woman's path from military service to public service, like I said, is a compelling story in its own right. And most of these women that I named were accomplished firsts in their service careers before ever entering the world of politics. That has been the focus of the reporting and publishing on most of their experiences the first woman with military experience, the first woman with combat experience, the first woman to enter a specific service academy, everyone sort of racking up a first of some kind. Journalists have featured some of the more contemporary women in brief articles or in short biographical pieces, so they've been featured in Vogue or The Atlantic, some even on the cover of The New York Times. MJ Hager released an autobiography in 2017, primarily recounting the story of her military career that shoot like a girl pictured up here in the middle. That's actually been optioned for a film as well. Uh, personal and political memoirs were released by Joni Ernst and Martha McSally in 2020. So you can see Martha McSally's book up in the middle, Joni Ernst's books to the right there, Daughter of the Heartland. Tammy Duckworth released hers most recently. Her memoir is up in the top left and it's not an accident that it's the same picture. The bottom right is the feature in vogue on her that used the same image. Um, on the left we have Rolling Stone which features Tulsi Gabbard front and center and we can talk more about her pop culture personality a little bit too. The popularity of these trade publications demonstrates that there really is a growing public interest in the stories of these women. And so the hope through Service Above Self is to offer a scholarly analysis of their political trajectories and contribute to this larger public conversation on who these women are and what their path to politics looks like. The famous firsts for women in the military or quasi-military roles also marked important cracks in both glass walls and ceilings that paved the way for subsequent women to enter service careers. Yet I believe their accomplishments represent the tip of the proverbial iceberg, observable milestones just above the surface that indicate the presence of social, political, and cultural shifts in women's history and politics that preceded them. Their presence reflects an increasing number of women entering armed forces, as well as the longer legacy of women serving in national public office who worked on issues of defense, who worked on foreign relations, 
and policies serving American veterans. So in this research, I endeavor to balance recommendations and remarkable firsts with their antecedents and these longer milestones in American political and military history. So with this in mind, I decided to focus specifically on women running for national office in the project. Similar analysis could be done at the state or local levels. I divided the stories into three parts, each focusing on a different national political institution. So part one focuses on the US House of Representatives, part two focuses on the US Senate, and the third part focuses on the American presidency. So we'll talk about the House first. <clears throat> I begin by looking at historical and contemporary examples of service women elected to the US House of Representatives. Before the emergence of this recent political cohort in 2018 and 2020, relatively few women veterans served in national political office. I started by sharing stories of the first women with military or what I call quasi-military careers. Women like Edith Norse Rogers, Margaret Chase Smith, Kathy Small Long, Heather Wilson, and several others were significant antecedents to the contemporary service candidates. Their stories collectively illustrate a longer history of women politicians with service backgrounds and the legacy of their legislative accomplishments on behalf of service members. As advocates for policies providing veterans benefits, Edith Norse Rogers, who authored the GI Bill, reserve and full military status legislation for women, all of this happening in the early and mid 20th century. As the contributions of women were recognized and institutionalized in the US military, the number of eligible female veterans and service women to run increased. New opportunities available to women also attracted individuals who chose the military as a career or a profession, rather than as a temporary form of service in a moment of national crisis. Institutional changes and greater access to preferred positions made the military a more appealing career choice for more women and the institutional changes laid the groundwork to collectively increase the number of women in their service and related roles. I'll say one thing about this before I go on. I love this picture of Edith Norse Rogers, like looking over FDR's shoulders just to make sure he signs that appropriately and correctly. She also has a fabulous hat, and I'm pretty sure she was the only woman in that room. So really enjoyed this just on a personal note. Moving from the historical chapter to the more recent candidates, among this impressive class of newly elected representatives entering the US House in 2018 were five national security women with no political experience actively working to change voter perceptions of what it meant to be a veteran in Congress. I looked at the professional backgrounds and path to elected office for five security Dems, also known collectively by other nicknames, of Congress with national security backgrounds, including their issue positions, their political projects, uh, their campaign fundraising, and their electoral success. So moving across here, we have Representative Chrissy Houlihan, Houlihan on the far left, on the top. Um, we have Alyssa Slatkin, we have Mikey Sherrill, MJ Hager. She was not elected, but I do discuss her and Amy McGrath both in that chapter as well. Um, Abigail Spanberger, Elaine Luria, and Gina Ortez. So the women on the left were successfully elected to office. The three sort of over here on the right did not win their elections. And I talk more about that in detail in that chapter. The second part of the work focuses on women elected to the US Senate. So probably these are some of the more famous or notable names that you may be familiar with if you're outside the state where they are currently representing. Tammy Duckworth, Democrat of Illinois, Joni Ernst, Republican of Iowa, Martha McSally, Republican of Arizona, and then I'll talk about Tulsi Gabbard in their presidential bid here in just a moment. Tammy Duckworth is a woman who has achieved many firsts. The Senate's first member to give birth while in office, its first member born in Thailand, its first female amputee. As a wounded veteran with a purple heart, she has introduced or co-sponsored bills protecting the rights of veterans, and she's been fearless in confronting the former president over military and foreign affairs. I share Tammy Duckworth's story in the project from 1968 in Bangkok, Thailand, 
to April 2018, when at the age of 50, she became the first female senator to give birth while holding office. And you can see how important that moment was to her in the photos that were selected for both her memoir cover and the Vogue feature, where she's with her children. Joni Ernst, the second subject of US Senate section, wants supporters to know that she is a mother, a soldier, and a leader. She believes she has a mandate from the voters of Iowa to take on Washington and deliver a pledge to make them squeal, which is the line derived from her viral campaign commercial if you haven't seen it. As the first woman elected to federal office in Iowa, the first combat veteran elected uh, as a woman, and now one of the first Republican women to serve on the prestigious Senate Judiciary Committee, Ernst served her country both in the Army Reserves and the Iowa National Guard for over 23 years including leading a unit in the Middle East in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom that drove convoys through Kuwait and southern Iraq. She retired in 2015 as a lieutenant colonel in the Iowa National Guard, having served in every leadership position from platoon leader to battalion commander. And the final senator included is Arizona Republican appointee Martha McSally. In the project, I explore how she emerged from traumatic moments in her early life to achieve academic excellence throughout high school and the U.S. Air Force Academy. McSally served in the U.S. Air Force until 2010 and rose to the rank of colonel before retiring. One of the highest ranking female pilots in the history of the Air Force, she was the first American woman to fly in combat following the 1991 lifting of the prohibition on female combat pilots. And she was also the first female commander of a U.S. Air Force fighter squadron. In 2001, she continued to push boundaries and sued the United States Department of Defense in McSally v. Rumsfeld, challenging the military policy that required U.S. and United Kingdom service women stationed in Saudi Arabia to wear the body covering abaya when traveling off base in the country. Nicknamed Longshot for her electoral struggles as a political candidate, uh, McSally was eventually appointed a U.S. senator uh, representing Arizona in 2018. The final institution in the book, the U.S. Presidency, focuses on the military and political career of Representative Tulsi Gabbard, a military combat veteran serving as the U.S. Representative for Hawaii's second congressional district and a member of the Democratic Party. Gabbard was also a 2016 and 2020 presidential candidate, the first woman with military or quasi-military service experience since Margaret Chase Smith to actively seek a presidential nomination. Smith served as the Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Air Force Reserve from 1950 to 1958, and was the first woman to actively seek the nomination of a major political party for presidency in 64. She's included in the historical chapter of the book. Um, Gabbard's career, however, in American politics has also been measured by a series of firsts. The first state official to voluntarily step down from public office to serve in a war zone, the first woman to ever be awarded and honored by the Kuwait National Guard for her work in training and readiness programs, and one of the first two female combat veterans to ever serve in U.S. Congress, and also its first Hindu member. Gabbard is also one of the first post-9-11 veterans to run for the White House. And my research examines Gabbard's rapidly rising, at times controversial, profile in national politics. When I began my effort to connect the stories of these women with military and quasi-military backgrounds who served in national office, some names were more familiar than others, particularly those who've made recent news headlines. Their stories have been told individually by journalists and in some case scholars before this writing. But there is a familiar saying, when drinking the well, when drinking the water, don't forget who dug the well. As I researched more deeply the stories of the women in the headlines, my questions drew me further into the stories of the women and advocates who preceded them. It was almost like pulling at a thread. You just keep pulling and see what unravels. Each accolade, or first, was accomplished with support from the well digging of generations of service women and their allies in government before them. And the legacy of each service woman in this book transcends her specific accomplishments in service or in politics. The whole of the story is greater than the sum of its parts. So what can we learn from this broader view of American women in politics from reading these collective stories? 
Each service woman story examines the factors that motivated the candidate or Congress member to seek office, further contributing to the liter on literature on political ambition and political participation. This includes the motivations for these women seeking their first elected office at the local or state level, even before the national level, as well as factors that influence their decision to continue pursuing subsequent electoral positions. So this could be from Tammy Duckworth's rise from the House of Representatives to the US Senate, Joni Ernst's move from Iowa State government to the US Senate, or Tulsi Gabbard's entry into the Democratic presidential primaries from her position in the House of Representatives. Broadly speaking, the pool of eligible women for political office is shaped by structural factors. So we'll kind of enumerate some of these as I go along. Specifically, when I'm talking about structural factors, the growth and opportunities for women's service and leadership in the military. As service women and their allies in government fought to institutionalize women's positions and better occupational choices became open to women in the military, as women assumed leadership positions in the military, increasing number of women pursued careers in the armed services. <coughs> Excuse me. This advocacy and change were supported by what scholars have called extant factors in military and political life, wars, military institutions, and politics. For early service women, the social, economic, and political disruptions of war created opportunities and necessities for their participation in military and quasi-military work. Legislative initiatives and directives from the executive branch of government lifted barriers for women entering service academies, expanding their eligibility for permanent status, combat roles, and even leadership positions. Most of the women analyzed in Service Above Self were recruited or encouraged to run for political office, which follows a pattern outlined in recent studies of women in political participation more broadly. Some scholars argue that it has a combination of a lack of recruitment and beliefs about how office holding will affect their political lives and relationships that affects women's ambition to pursue elected office. Some scholars believe that social expectations around gender, with politics being viewed as a masculine sphere, lead some women to feel less qualified to hold public office. However, this relational paradigm doesn't neatly align with the experiences of the women I analyze in Service Above Self, who chose to enter military service, an arguably masculine institution, prior to seeking elected office. The question is whether the bombardments of war adequately prepared them for the bombast of electoral politics. The narratives featured in this work also reveal how education, training, and socialization of service women in their military and quasi-military careers shape their attitudes about gender in the military, as well as gender in politics. In both capacities, these women expressed a desire to be treated as individuals without regard to their sex. Tammy Duckworth insisted that her decisions within the military were not based on, quote, being the first female anything. It's about not wanting to be average, end quote. When Joni Ernst sought membership in her new military leadership role, she reiterated to her commanders that she did not specifically need a woman mentor. She said, the way I saw it, a soldier is a soldier. It doesn't matter your gender. You still have the same job to do, end quote. Yet these stories and those of other service women in the project illustrate that their experiences were shaped by gender. The prevalence of sexual assault and discrimination in their lived experiences gave them unique insights when they were appointed to congressional committees with oversight on military service academies under investigation for those issues. Martha McSally's challenge to dress code policies for service women in Saudi Arabia, MJ Hager's efforts to overturn ground combat exclusion policies barring women, and several other examples of women who fought against inequitable policies and standards actually elucidate how gender influenced their experiences and opportunities within the armed services. Caitlin Sidorsky's All Roads Lead to Power, a reference in my research, analyzes the political motivations of women who accept appointed positions. And she found that appointed women pursue their positions, quote, for an ambition unrelated to the political career ladder, end quote. Like many of the women in her study, the women with military and intelligence backgrounds I write about in this work do not view public office and pursue it for simply the sake of gaining political power, advantage, or prestige. Rather, they believe elected political office as a pathway and an outlet for their sense of civic duty 
and responsibility and an obligation to serve. Their political careers become an extension of their military careers in their vision, rather than a break from their prior national service. The oath of enlistment, for example, requires service members to swear or affirm that they will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and bear true faith and allegiance to the same. The Congressional Oath of Office begins with the same refrain. Service members draw a clear line between their oath to defend the country in uniform and their oath in public service. Some examples where we see this, Several members of the Security Democrats cohort in Congress expressed concerns that they believed the presidential administration of Donald Trump posed a clear domestic threat to the Constitution in the United States, a concern that bore out in the Capitol attack of January 6th. Some service members felt that their military or quasi-military service prepared them to shape a mas American national security or foreign policy, an important perspective as the number of veterans actually declines in Congress on the whole and others expressed their interest in running for elected office as a calling or a duty, or saw political service as an extension of their prior, prior military service to the country. Though many of the service women entered politics with a service-oriented, or we could call it a mission-focused approach to public policy making, many of them struggled to balance that goal with partisan politics. Tulsi Gabbard's independent positions on foreign policy often put her at odds with Democratic Party leadership, um, though Joni Ernst and Martha McSally hoped to maintain independent perspectives on behalf of their respective home states, their voting records aligned with Republican President Trump's administration more than 90% of the time. And we could probably conduct a similar analysis between 2020 and 22 of Democratic veterans. And despite strong recruitment efforts and substantial funding support, which I do talk about in many of the House races, service women candidates are not always successful candidates for office and some veterans do not win their electoral contests. In Kentucky's sixth district, Democrat Amy McGrath, a veteran Marine fighter pilot, came within three percentage points of unseating her opponent, Republican Congressman Andy Barr, who won a fourth term in office that year. She subsequently lost by an even larger margin to incumbent Senate Majority Leader Republican Mitch McConnell in 2020. Air Force veteran MJ Hager, a Democrat, also lost a tight race to incumbent Republican Representative John Carter in Texas's 31st district, a conservative swath presidential, uh, President Donald Trump won in 2016. And she also lost her senatorial challenge to incumbent Texas Republican John Cornyn in 2020. The chronological structure of the initial chapters in this project also revealed characteristics that differentiate generations of veterans and service women who served prior to 9-11 from those who served during the War on Terror and in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Some examples. Veterans from more recent conflicts have the highest levels of education of any previous cohort of service members. More than three quarters of post 9-11 and Gulf War veterans have at least some college experience and more than one third of Gulf War veterans had a college degree. Post 9-11 veterans also have a 43% chance of experience a service-related disability after accounting for differences in demographic and social characteristics among veterans, which is significantly higher than veterans of prior periods. And according to Pew Research Center, roughly three quarters of post 9-11 veterans were deployed at least once, compared with 58% of those who served before them. Post 9-11 veterans are about twice as likely as their pre-9-11 counterparts to have served in a combat zone as well. And finally, post 9-11 women veterans are also more racially diverse and younger than their male colleagues. So there are descriptive differences as well. The average level of educational attainment, increasing percentage of women, and diversification of service members is reflected in the personal and professional backgrounds of the post 9-11 service women featured in this work. So we'll take a minute to talk about some avenues of future research, because I don't view this as a finished project. Though the number of women with service backgrounds in Congress is at a historically high level, they still represent a small sample that presents challenges for statistical analysis especially for students in here, you wouldn't go to your faculty with an N of 12 to try to generalize anything in statistics, right? 
Likewise, political action committees, political parties, and private organizations have worked vigorously to recruit service and servant leader candidates for elected office. Scholars and others should take note of how these organizations inform the public of their mission, how they promote the importance of support for service candidates, and how their recruitment efforts are successful or otherwise. Groups such as New Politics or With Honor Action, which identifies itself as a cross-partisan movement dedicated to promoting and advancing principled veteran leadership and elected public service, are worth taking note. And the Service First Women's Victory Fund, which was actually organized by the five security Democrats, represent a parallel emerging trend. Finally, future research will continue to measure the political impact of women and veterans who serve in office. And in telling their stories, this work identifies shared experiences that bind them together as service women, as well as factors that distinguish them from one another in political life. Whether looking at service women's experiences across history or as individual biographies, it's my hope that Service Above Self provides a foundational synthesis with insights into the motivations of these women who have served their country to broaden this natural chapter in American history and politics. So I will stop there to reserve some time for Q&A. Um, so I think we have students with dedicated mics who get to be in charge of this part. If you have any questions, just please raise your hand. I'll come over and hold the microphone for you. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering how you mentioned that if you had some extra time, you could maybe go into kind of what your perception of like this, like the current election results yeah. were. Kind of, yeah, what do you think of that in terms of kind of the work that you do? Cool. So good question. I did tease that. So thank you for asking an excellent question. It's like a softball, right? I pitched it up and you knocked it out. Um, I actually put together just in case like a couple pictures so I could talk about it in the background. So I looked at the timing of this talk and I was like, okay, we should, we should know some of the results in a week, right? I can, I can get that data together before I come and visit with you all. Um, so I took a look at the women that I studied in my book and I tried to see how they performed in the 22 election. All of them were reelected if they were in an electoral contest with the exception of one. So Elaine Luria, the Democrat from Virginia, actually lost her race. Um, but what's interesting for me is that the person who defeated her is Jen Kiggins, also a woman veteran, also from the Navy. So interesting. Um, more women veterans were fielded again, this time in larger numbers by the Republican Party than in the prior electoral cycles. Um, we have three new women veterans who were elected to the House. So Marionette Miller-Meeks, I mentioned Jen Kiggins, and Anna Paulina Luna um, <clears throat> were three successful candidates out of that cohort. So I believe 196 total veterans were on the ballot, which is still a higher number even than the prior two election cycles. So the trend is still slightly notching up, more veterans are still running. 130 of those were non-incumbents or candidates who didn't have prior political office or experience, so I think we could still call them a form of a political outsider, so that trend continued. Um, and more women again, so 17 women veterans among that cohort. And we did see some electoral success. We also saw a lot of losses, so you can go and look at the map where some of them were challenging in Indiana and California and they didn't quite have success. I haven't looked at those races enough to tell you why I think they won or lost. Um, but for, for my purposes, I see this as a continuing trend for the time being. And my N is getting a little bigger. Perhaps someday we'll get to that point where I feel comfortable doing some statistical analysis on it. But I do think it's a trend continuing for now especially with the number of PACs, um, political action committees, and recruitment groups that have sprung up to recruit veteran candidates, as long as there is money and support and training and a recruitment effort underway, I think the trend will continue. That's a good question. That was not a plant.
Hello, I just want to say thank you for being here. Um, I was wondering, so do you think the trend will continue even though the military is facing a shortage of people joining in recent times? It's a good question, right? Military academies are having a difficult time uh, recruiting students, just like some colleges are across the country. If we don't have a pool of service candidates, then we don't have, right? Um, I think the military is an incredibly intelligent institution and it will figure out a way to recruit new candidates at some point. And I don't see that pool shrinking dramatically. I think it, I think it will be there. Um, in terms of the structural factors, that's a little bit harder to predict, right? Um, because when we look at the opportunity that war creates for disruption in military recruitment and service, when we look at um, legislative reform, those things are a little bit harder to predict. Um, but I do see the military's effort to vigorously recruit more women, um, different, can, different potential um, service members as continuing. Hello, uh, what were your research methods for starting and continuing in this book? That's a really good question, especially because um, I wrote the book in what we affectionately call COVID times. <laughs> so when I submitted the proposal for the book when I'd already done about a third of the research already and I was kind of had a plan to close the gate, it was March of 2020. That was awesome climbing, you know. <laughs> um, what I will say is the more contemporary candidates, there is a wealth of archival material, digital archival material on the C-SPAN archives, right? So I can log on to my computer and watch hours of footage from interviews at Walter Reed Hospital and interviews with a lot of these women. I can watch their debates. Um, there's just tons and tons, this wealth of footage on C-SPAN archives. So that was a really important resource to me when I couldn't go to physical archives because of COVID closures. Um, and was really helpful for the more contemporary candidates. Other things that I utilized, um, social media. So candidates like Tulsi Gabbard, right? She has this prolific social media presence, podcasts, YouTubes, Twitter. So I had all this digital social media that I could kind of try to wade through and harness to learn more about her positions um, and, and really how her campaign style developed. YouTube all these political commercials on YouTube. I used to go to the Living Room Candidate website, which has fabulous archival um, examples of campaign commercials. But now you can find a lot of original campaign commercials on YouTube. So, you know, I found Joni Ernst's Make em Squeal campaign commercial on there and got to watch that and then show everyone I knew what that looked like. Um, so a lot of digital resources kept me going in the early months of COVID. And then um, the historian in me really loves archival research, and so I was kind of itching to get out and get back into actual boxes of paper. So the first archival trip I made as COVID restrictions were easing was to the Margaret Chase Smith uh, Library and Museum, which I highly recommend. Um, incredibly wonderful staff, rich material. If you've never been to that part of Maine, it is pretty beautiful. And if you don't know, Margaret Chase Smith sort of built her museum around and over her house. So when you go to it, you can actually go visit her house with her porch that she sat on and greeted constituents in, you know, every day. Um, but it's, it's perfectly preserved. It's like you're walking into a beautiful 1960s ranch. Um, so that staff was wonderful to work with in setting up testing protocols of how do we do archival research in COVID and they have wonderful collections. And then other archivists were wonderful about sending me materials. So I could email Louisiana State for Kathy Small Long papers. I was in Massachusetts, I wasn't far from Harvard to get some of Edith Norse Rogers papers. But those archivists were at the ready to help and support and send me anything I needed. So I combed through a lot of archives, I watched hours and hours of digital footage of different interviews. Um, and sort of put it all together. I did do some interviews with candidates, some on the record, some off the record. An on the record interview I did was with MJ Hager. Um, she was wonderfully down to earth and willing to share her story and made time for all of my questions, multiple rounds of questions. Um, and I will, I will confess that I connected with her and some other candidates 
by like cold calling them on LinkedIn. I saw their profiles and I sent them a message like, I am not a crazy person. Would you like to talk about this stuff? And they responded. So that was, that was pretty awesome. It was pretty awesome. So some of those methods were very, you know, academic and scholarly and some maybe not, but we get creative. Did you also get to go to Hawaii to, <laughs> to research Tulsi Gabbard? And also along those lines, um, could you talk about her military experience and how that forms some of her more independent foreign policy? Absolutely. Unfortunately, Tulsi Gabbard did not take up any of my offers to be her bag woman in Hawaii. Um, I'm still waiting for the call, Tulsi, if you're listening. Um, but no, I, I think that's a great question because Tulsi Gabbard, as I researched her materials, and I plan to do an independent project on her anyway because I just find her communication style and her policy position so interesting, is this blend in my mind of an aloha ethos with a, a dash of populism and then sort of a, a consistent liberalism in there. And when you mix those together, it comes out in interesting ways. I think there is a very logical, consistent position to how she approaches foreign policy. We invite everyone to the table for conversation, even people we don't like, even people we don't agree with. Now for her, that meant she would go to hear Benjamin Netanyahu address Congress. She would meet with Assad in Syria. She would engage in conversation, she mentioned, with dictators from other states, when that was not a popular position to take within her party's primary in particular. But that's part of her consistent approach based on her experience. Um, she uses this phrase, the true cost of war, a lot. And I think that comes from her military experience, um, having to report on injuries and deaths and tracking um, things that were happening overseas during her time of service. And so witnessing that kind of harm and that kind of violence really created an impression on her of the human toll of war in some ways that maybe we don't see as often anymore if we don't have as many boots on the ground conflicts or if we have more drone warfare, if we're more disengaged, right? But for her, that became a really important way that she thought about what war cost American society. Um, so she uses that phrase a lot. <clears throat> she also uses the phrase service above self, um, which is the title of my book. And I didn't draw it just necessarily from Tulsi's uh, language, but I think it's that same refrain and ethos that you are doing this work because you are trying to honor and advance something above and beyond just you. Um, I was actually looking at, before I came here, uh, there was a quote from Senator Bob Dole, um, and it was from, I think, one of his last published pieces in December of 2021. And he wrote that, when we prioritize principles over party and humanity over personal legacy, we accomplish far more as a nation. And I think that that ethos really is what is captured in Service Above Self and what some of these women candidates are trying to advance. Are we doing the lean and clap? Last chance for questions. Be in my classrooms. When I stare around the room and make eye contact, I can usually, I can usually get one. So, but I won't put anybody on the spot. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, and I'm happy to chat one-on-one, -on -one too, if you have questions that you just didn't want to ask in front of the group, too. I'm slightly introverted. I'm a one-on-one -on -one questioner. Yeah. 